This evening, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jeff Brzezinski. Dr. Brzezinski completed his PhD in anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder in 2019, and is currently a lecturer in the department. His dissertation entitled Criminal Formative Religion and Political Organization on the Coast of Oaxaca, Mexico, the perspective from Sara de la Virgen, explored the rise of the first complex polity at the site of Rio Vejo in the first century, BC, uh, first century CE. This polity lasted for only about 100 years, and his thesis focused on how strong local affiliations were maintained through communal religious practices, and how this likely prevented the formation of a long-term regional political authority. He is excavated at Caracol in Belize and extensively in the Rio Verde, Verde region of Oaxaca, including directing his own project. His numerous publications and conference papers have stemmed both from his field work and his doctoral research and include topics in material culture, such as pottery and architecture, as well as theoretical approaches to complex societies. Tonight he brings several of these themes together in this talk, Materiality for the Archaeological Enthusiast, Case Studies in Human Thing Assemblages from Ancient Mesoamerica. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brzezinski. Sorry, Jeff, can you unmute? Oh, dogs. <laughs> Excuse me for one second. I have a dog that uh, just decided to start barking right at the beginning of my lecture. So give me one second here. Okay. COVID problems, right? All right, so uh, thank you, Dr. James, for that warm introduction. And uh, thank you to the Boulder chapter of the AIA for inviting me to share some, uh, some really cool archeology span with you guys tonight. Um, uh, I think it's wonderful that this chapter has such a great participation and enthusiasm, and it's kept going through the turmoil of the last year plus. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, tonight, I wanna to talk about a new body of theory that's received increasing attention over the past decade in archeological circles. And that's the field of materiality. So we're gonna explore some of the principles of this kind of newly uh, and loosely defined paradigm and kind of see where it can, what it can offer us in terms of adding nuance and sophistication to our interpretations of the past. <clears throat> All right, so the main question we wanna to address tonight is, you know, how do objects make us human? And so by doing that, we're going to be addressing uh, a few theoretical concepts first, uh, including kind of outlining what the theory of materiality is in the field of materiality, and also kind of more specific items in that field, including what assemblages are, and also what we mean by the ontological turn in anthropology. And so we're going to do that by doing some case studies. Uh, the first one is looking at some objects with voices among uh, Maya communities. And in general, we're going to be looking at the northern lowlands and southern lowlands. And we're going to be doing that through different periods of time. Then we're going to shift focus and go over to the Valley of Oaxaca and think about the origins of urbanism from this perspective of materiality. And then we're going to use both of those kind of things that we uh, gleaned from those case studies in analyzing some of the research that I've done uh, for my PhD in, the, uh, in coastal Oaxaca, Mexico, so in the lower Rio Verde Valley of uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. So, you know, to understand the development of archaeological theory over the last few decades, we really need to start by outlining the broader history of the subject. And we can do that by beginning with a simple thought exercise. And, and this is an anecdote that's adapted from Oliver Harris and Craig Sipola's 2017 book. So let's first imagine that we're working at a hypothetical site in Mesoamerica, that area that I just showed you on that map. <clears throat> And we're excavating one of the most common archeological features, a, a midden or a pit. So after uh, emptying a bucket full of sediment, we encounter several artifacts, including some painted pottery, a green stone ax, and a couple of stingray spines. So the, the question is, how might we go about interpreting this find? Uh, so let's first imagine that we also have a time machine that allows us to transport senior scholars from the last hundred years to represent the three major uh, theoretical paradigms in archeological theory which is cultural history, processualism, and post-processualism. So the oldest scholar, the uh, cultural historian, 
uh, which you know vaguely comes to us from the 1930s, uh, takes great pains to describe the objects in detail and explains that what you really need to do is to compare the finds from this pit to other local sites to reveal whether what we have is a typological match. Uh, so according to him, painted bowls like the ones that we have here uh, are found in neighboring units, or excuse me, neighboring regions to the north at an earlier date. And remember, this is, this is hypothetical. This is an actual, uh, uh, actual context. Uh, so what he says is this is clear evidence of diffusion, that they migrated from elsewhere. So the second professor, the processualist, uh, who comes to us from the 1970s or so, uh, looks on and she's disappointed, right? She says that what the first professor, uh, you know, makes some good descriptions of the artifacts, and, uh, but we real, what we really need to be doing is thinking about how these objects show how people that made them adapted to the local environment. Uh, so in other words, we need to think scientifically and think about how objects facilitated cultural adaptations to environmental stimuli. So for example, she says, uh, pottery would have allowed these people to cook and store food efficiently, um, while the presence of stingray spines might indicate something like subsistence strategies that were focused on marine resources. Uh, the greenstone ax, uh, she says, uh, was most certainly a prestige good, likely obtained by the local chief through his uh, trade networks. Uh, and so uh, now the third professor, the post-processualist, comes to the defense of the culture historian. And he, uh, she says, well, you know, his work is a bit outdated. Uh, at least he was telling specific stories about the past and not generalizing based on kind of universal natural laws. Uh, so the, the critical thing she says is the meaning behind the artifact. Uh, perhaps she says that the combination of the pottery and stingray spines represents the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of the domestic and the wild and that the green color of the ax symbolically indicates uh, or indi indexes the role of agriculture in the ritual economies of these people. All right, so uh, th that is the basic paradigm that we have in archeology, span the cultural history, the processualist paradigm, and the post-processualist kind of critique. And all three of these ideas are still employed in some way, shape, or form in archeological theorizing and uh, analysis. Now let's think about some issues with our three make-believe professors. The, the first one is that uh, one issue is that while it might seem like they're, uh, they're occupying a wide range of differing positions, what they really did was flip-flop back and forth between two opposed poles, one that privileges subjects and ideas and beliefs, and the other that studies objects and nature and materials and science. Uh, so that's essentially a series of dualisms. Uh, another one is anthropocentrism. So with all of those uh, hypothetical analyses of those artifacts, there was little attention that was focused on the objects themselves. They only mattered in the sense that people that uh, the people thought, uh, were able to think with them or use them in particular ways. So while you know this is far from a set of cohesive principles, the critique that the new materialism or materiality in general poses on all three of these is that scholars working within this paradigm seek to shed all of these dualisms, all right? They uh, want to consider the other than human things on an equal footing with human agency. And so this is what's often referred to as an, a flat ontology. So let's kind of look at what some of these things might uh, look like. So the best way to take uh, an other than human things more seriously is to begin with a, uh, excuse me, a symmetrical approach. And so that affords things that are not human, the capacity for agency. And this is mostly based on uh, Bruno Latour's work. And he looked at hybrid entities like the combination of what you see up here, which is the driver and the car. Now the driver can extend his agency out into the world based on the abilities of the car. The car cannot drive itself. And we're not talking about uh, you know, self-driving Teslas at this point. Uh, so the combination of the two is essentially a, a, a new altogether entity. So among the first to really draw archeologists attention to this kind of approach was anthropologist uh, Tim Ingle. And he published this really iconic paper in 2007 that asked the reader to do something really unique. And what he did was he asked the reader to go out and grab a rock or you know, a stone and dip it into a bucket of water and then leave the wet stone next to them as they read the paper. And so as the paper continues, and it's a theoretical paper, 
um, Ingold returns to the stone occasionally and describes how it might be changing. Uh, so by the end of the paper, the stone has pretty much dried out, but has left a couple of damp patches either on, on the table. And I actually did this when I read this paper. Uh, I put it on top of a, a piece of paper, and that paper itself was wet. And so <clears throat> what he notes is that the stone feels different. It's less shiny. The noise it makes when you knock it on something is, is different than uh, what it would have been before. Uh, and so the properties of the stone, you know, the materials, that most of us would say appear kind of totally uh, unfixed and unchanging can vary depending on the relationships that it's caught up in at any one time. So what we can kind of look at and think about is that the stone has a particular kind of history. But instead of thinking about trying to tell its biography, we can think instead of how the stone is caught up in an itinerary. And this is a concept that was developed by Rosemary Joyce and Susan Gillespie. And it, what this does is it takes into account the temporalities of things and how they can enter into and leave different assemblages at different times. <clears throat> uh, so to define an assemblage, it's really just the coming together of multiple different kinds of things with unique relations between them. And you know, what we consider to be a single whole at a particular gathering, at a particular time, and in a particular space. So I put up uh, Iron Man here to think about the way in which the combination of Tony Stark, who uh, by all accounts, and I'm not an expert in the Marvel universe, can't really do much outside of his suit. So the combination of the two is really important in terms of creating a new entity, uh, but we can also think about it through time. So if you remember back to the first Iron Man, uh, he comes out of uh, the uh, imprisonment with this kind of makeshift set of of uh, suit components. And by the end of the series, he's got something that's basically, you know, this, this sentient entity that encompasses him. So we can kind of look at how that suit varies in terms of the itinerary that it experiences. Uh, so when we think about assemblages, you have to think about some key concepts. And, and these can get a little bit complicated. And so I'm going to limit it to a, just a little bit of background and only three general sets of topics. The first one is territorialization. And so this is the process of assemblage, uh, and it can be thought of as a process of gathering, right? Through which the components are brought together to kind of constitute some sort of temporary group of relations. Um, and however, any component of an assemblage, and that includes people and other types of non, or other than human things, can become a part of a different assemblage. So this process is uh, of this movement between gatherings of components is deterritorialization. And it's important to note that it causes assemblages to have implications for each other. Now, re-territorialization is the process through which components function within their new assemblage. So I know that was a lot of technical gobbledygook, but I think some of the case studies that we're gonna get into will, will illuminate that a little bit more. Now, in the sense that we can think of objects as kind of flows of matter and space and time, objects can break down, right? They can decay, they can break apart. So we have to think about the way in which this process is given order. Uh, and so this is where coding comes in. So coding is really just the imposition of rules and regulations that impact how assemblages come together. Uh, decoding is now is basically the opposite through which these things kind of break down. And then overcoding is the way in which the original rules and regulations are overwritten gradually. So an example that uh, we can kind of think about, and this is a lot of this uh, research is based on uh, uh, Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's work in the, uh, in the late 20th century. And they talk about how, uh, they describe how feudal hierarchies in Europe were the means by which flows of goods and wealth were coded. Uh, but the circulation of things like money began to decode these structures. And then these structures were then overcoded by capitalism. So that's a really basic idea in terms of applying and coding. Now, the final thing that we have to look at, and I promise this is the last part of, you know, kind of our, our really dense theoretical section of the lecture, is the idea of stratification. Now, this is not in the sense of looking at stratigraphy in a, uh, an excavation unit, this is more about the process through which these flows of matter 
and materials and objects and time are sorted and then cemented together into a particular entity. So they can be strongly coded and strongly territorialized forms of assemblages. Um, and so destratification is essentially the opposite when they're kind of pulled apart. So we're gonna return to that uh, in a few slides, but before we do, I also wanna talk about the ontological turn in anthropology. Now, uh, one of the major developments in this kind of renewed interest in other than human things and the assemblages that they form is a renewed interest in the way in which non-Western societies conceive of reality. Uh, so this is their uh, specific ontology, how reality is conceived. And so the reality is that the way in which North Americans and Western Europeans conceive of the world is highly anthropocentric. The uh, Abrahamic religions, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, typically count humans as the only ones with souls or life forces, and there are some exceptions. But these are the, essentially the only things that uh, are animate beings. Now, in the ontologies of Native American societies like the Maya, like the Zapotec, like the Chitino, which are, which are the ethno-linguistic groups that we're going to be studying, uh, the boundaries between human and non-human things are often quite permeable. Uh, so really what this does is it affords uh, agency to a lot of different things, including things like animals, buildings, landforms like mountains and volcanoes and rivers and oceans, uh, sacred texts and speech, uh, deities and ancestors, and that's just to name a few. Uh, so what we're looking at here, and this is kind of the first uh, slide where we're actually gonna get into some archeology span stuff, is a mist that's emerging from a cave at dawn. Uh, and what this would have uh, represented or uh, you know, been for the reality of Native Americans would be the emergence of clouds from a specific landform, the cave. And we can kind of see this in terms of the way in which humans interact with this other than human thing. And this is Monument One at Chalcatzingo. Uh, so it's a site in, in Mexico. And what you have here is a leader that is uh, engaging in a ritual inside of a cave. And he's got uh, in his hands a sacred bundle, which is typically a very, very powerful set of objects that allow people to transverse different existential planes, uh, communicate with ancestors and deities. And what he's doing is he's engaging in a ritual that produces uh, mist and, um, and things that are coming out of that cave, which then form clouds, condense into terrain, and feed this uh, vegetation. Um, and in most indications, it would be maize. Uh, so in that sense, you know, the object, the other than human thing, does have agency in that, in that regard. <clears throat> so the, the concept of objects as, you know, expressing agency is, is widely attested in the archaeological and the ethnographic record of the Maya. Uh, so, for example, uh, Highland Maya images of saints that are placed on home altars are often said to eat and to drink the offerings that are left to them. Uh, so devotees might experience uh, or examine the cigarettes that are placed in the mouths of a figure like this, which is Maximon, <clears throat> to uh, look for signs of slow burning, which would indicate that the saint is smoking satisfactorily. Uh, and the, one of the interesting things about uh, Maximon is that uh, he's thought by a lot of analysts to be a blend of several different figures, uh, historically, biblically, uh, mythologically, including Pedro de Alvarado, who was a conquistador, a particularly nasty one, um, Judas, St. Peter, and also the uh, concept of mom, which is the uh, Maya concept of grandfather. Uh, and then perhaps the most famous example of animate objects among the Maya are the talking crosses that appeared during the 19th century caste war in Eastern Yucatan. Uh, so these caste wars actually persist in various forms uh, to the present. And although they are they're recognized as man-made, uh, the crosses are seen as containers of the divine essence of Christ. And therefore they're agents. They're endowed with this power of speech and of prophecy and things like that. So in contemporary Yucatan, these crosses are really understood to be growing from within the earth, uh, where the non-human persons that they, become, that they become must be 
fed and clothed and housed and otherwise cared for. So that's what we're seeing in this, in this image here with one of these talking crosses that's actually clothed in uh, you know, ritual garb. Now we can definitely find examples of breathing and speaking objects in the ancient Maya art and text. And you know, a variety of entities that are, uh, there are a lot of entities that are afforded um, the power of speech and, and pre, in a pre-Columbian context. And a lot of this work is based on uh, Matthew Looper's work. Uh, so uh, I'm pulling tremendously from, from him. Uh, and so one of these markers in Maya inscriptions is, is based on a particular verb that means say. Um, and the verb appears twice in the text of this famous hieroglyphic uh, piece of pottery known as the hummingbird vase. And this is from burial 196 at Tikal, Guatemala. And uh, the ending of both of these series of of uh, texts roughly translates to said the hummingbird to Itzamna. And Itzamna is the deity that's pictured there. He's actually the old god, but in this case, he's, he's uh, pictured in, in a young form. And he's the ruler of the heavens, of, uh, in the he excuse me, of the heavens and of um, day and night. And so the, the mythological context of this text and its associated image really likely relates to the Maya concepts of, of birds and other animals as, as things like messengers. <clears throat> so another important type of speaking, or in this case, a singing object is the, the musical instrument. And in this example uh, from the post-classic site of Santa Rita Corazal in Belize, uh, a divine musician, which you can see right here, <clears throat> on the left side plays this stationary drum that's emblazoned with a bound hide head, a globular body, and stepped legs. And so the multicolored sound scrolls that are coming out of the, uh, the skull's mouth and also out of the top of the drum kind of envelop the entire uh, image here, right? It's essentially enveloping him in sound. Now, although you know other mus uh, musical instruments in the class, uh, the post-classic Maya period, um, especially in paintings like this mural, depict sound scrolls, and a lot of times they're coming out of the mouth of elites and things like that. Um, this set that emerges from this drum mouth, uh, this drum's mouth, suggests a comparison of the sound of a drum to a particular voice. So, in that sense, you know uh, the idea of objects as being able to speak, you know, really is, in, is encoded in some of this imagery. All right, so now I wanna shift gears a little bit and go back to the ideas of assemblage theory that we were talking about a few slides ago and think about what they can tell us about the built landscapes and the origin of urbanism in the Valley of Oaxaca. And uh, I'm drawing very tremendously from Art Joyce's work uh, particularly his chapter from uh, the book, New Materialisms, Ancient Urbanisms. And I'm gonna keep it pretty short because I'm pretty sure that Art is in the uh, audience uh, tonight. And I'm sure he would want to go into a lot more detail, but I'm going to uh, just talk about it in the sense of being able to apply some of these principles to the case study that we're gonna end with, which is uh, the uh, context of, of politics and religion on the coast of Oaxaca. Uh, so the main areas that we're looking at here, and this is the Valley of Oaxaca, are uh, two sites. One of them is San Jose Magote up here in the Etla arm of the Valley of Oaxaca. And then we're also gonna be talking about Monte Alban. Uh, so the uh, large uh, political center that emerges at about 500 BCE in the very center of this confluence of, um, of arms of this valley. So beginning with, Mound one at San Jose Magote, uh, this is the ceremonial center of the site. Now, the earliest construction of uh, you know, this area begins just after 700 BCE, and it focuses on uh, it's the focus of assemblages of humans and other than human entities that end up being vital to the founding of Monte Alban some 200 years later. So, what Art argues in this paper is that it's the liminal placement of Mound One at, on a natural hill where sky and rain and clouds and earth all converge. 
And so prior to its initial construction, there are several pits that are excavated into the surface of the hill, even before we have kind of formal architecture on the top. Uh, and into the pits, there was deposited river sand, but also some really interesting, um, you know, exotic objects, including human remains that are covered in pigments, uh, as well as ceramic vessels, figurines, uh, marine shell, jade, as well as faunal bone and fish bone. Um, and what this does is it presages a pattern that emerges where people placed offerings prior to or at the onset of building construction. And what that does is it territorializes or it's a process of territorialization in which what is created is the region's first mountain of creation or sustenance, um, well, the creation and sustenance. And where coding comes into this, uh, in, my, in my opinion, and, and uh, you know, I, I might be a little off base here, but um, most of the, or all of the objects that are deposited into these, these pits are exotic and they're non-local with the potential capacity to index certain things like water with shells and fish bones, rain and maize with greenstone, and blood and sacrifice with the red pigments. So what, what Art argues is that uh, this built landscape is an infrastructure, right? And it's an infrastructure through which social differences and cosmic planes end up becoming stratified. So there's that, that third kind of set of terms that we're looking at. And so we kind of talked about cosmic planes a little bit, being able to traverse these different uh, levels of the, uh, the cosmos. But when we think about social differences, that needs to be explained a little bit more. And I think the best way to do that is to look at uh, this monument, Monument 3 from uh, San Jose Mazote. And this is the first example in uh, the Valley of Oaxaca of human sacrifice. Uh, so what we have here is an elite. And he has, he has the heart glyph, so it's uh, very obvious that he is uh, being sacrificed. Uh, we also have blood glyphs here on the side of the monument. And he's actually named. So uh, typically only elites were named. So we know this is an elite person. We know that he's sacrificed. And what this tells us is that in addition to kind of infusing the landscape with uh, objects that have their own vitality, right, have their own essence, their life force, there were other things that humans also tried to do to essentially kind of gain the system to, to make sure that things were happening the way they wanted to. And this kind of all comes back to what we would call the sacred covenant. So this is a fundamental principle of religious practice and cosmology in Mesoamerica broadly. And this, this particular set of uh, uh, codices is from the, um, one of the Mishtek codices. So a little bit far removed and a little bit later in time, but it really, tells us a similar story in that this covenant is between people and the gods. And in order for people to be able to um, practice agriculture, which causes the gods great pain, the gods require humans to give up uh, their bodies in death. Right? And so that explains death, but it also explains other forms of ritual sacrifice, including auto-sacrifice, where somebody does it to themselves by bloodletting, or, uh, and also human sacrifice, where it's done usually through a ritual captive. And it also de uh, defines the relationship between nobles and commoners, in the sense that nobles are the ones that can uh, invoke this covenant in more potent ways. So all of these things are kind of uh, really important at San Jose Magote at the end of the um, middle formative, uh, but another thing that happens with this building, this mon, uh, Mound One, is that one of the temples at the very top is burned. Uh, and what that causes is uh, a great amount of, or potentially causes a great amount of political calamity. And so what ends up happening is that people end up moving from that location to uh, an even better location, right? So it led to the founding of a new political center in the even more imposing hills at the center of the valley. And, and Art, Art, uh, Joyce argues that uh, the physical position included many of the key elements of those assemblages at San Jose Magote, even before people arrived. So that kind of brings into this idea of uh, object agency independent of humans. And so these included the, the confluence of earth and sky and clouds and wind and rain. 
Uh, but at, you know, at San Jose Magote, it was clear that the demands of earth and rain required some new ways to petition the gods. And that is where human sacrifice comes in. And in particular, to transfer vitality to uh, bring about agricultural fertility. And one of those ways is to infuse animacy into the built landscape. And so these, the ephemeral parts of these assemblages afforded their, uh, their capacity to be deterritorialized from San Jose Magote and then re-territorialized at Monte Alban. And so this was done by uh, lots of construction projects that marked the main plaza as a vital conduit to the cosmos. Uh, and so the two places that we're gonna look at primarily are the North Platform. So this photo is being taken from the North Platform. And then also the uh, South Platform, which is in the, in the background here. <clears throat> so beginning with the South Platform, uh, one of the major things that is found in terms of the iconography and uh, the material culture in that area is allusions to sacrifice. So these are a couple of examples of the Danzantes. Uh, so this is a sculptural program uh, in and around uh, most of the buildings in, in uh, the Southern uh, platform. It's, it's unclear where they were in their original form, but they, were in, they ended up being reset in various places in that area. And this is uh, you know, carrying with it a lot of allusions to the underworld, to death and to sacrifice. <clears throat> and in the North platform, there's a completely different host of iconographic conventions. Uh, and these reference lightning and rain and storm gods and also elite genealogies, meaning that there are references to uh, ven uh, venerated ancestors. So on the left here, we have a, an urn of the Zapotec rain deity Cosillo. And this would have been something that would be found in, uh, in many contexts in and around the North Platform, as well as the uh, Viborone uh, frieze, which is, is a little bit more abstract, but is referencing um, the sky and different elements of climatic phenomena. And so what we have here is a built landscape that is representation of the cosmos. And this is a term known as the axis mundi. Uh, so again, on the North platform, you have allusions to the, uh, the celestial realm. And then the South platform to the underworld. And what this kind of represents is this idea of the cosmos. And this is kind of a cartoonish uh, example here that I blatantly pulled from Google. Um, but uh, what we have here is a way in which the cosmos is thought about in Mesoamerican um, cosmologies. And with, with the underworld uh, being at the bottom, the heavens, the celestial realm being at the top, and it's connected through essentially a, uh, a series of earthly um, landforms, in this case, a Seba tree. And so what argue, Art also argues in this paper, uh, and in many papers before, is that what we can do is take this idea and then rotate it onto the landscape where the underworld becomes the south, the celestial realm becomes the north, and the area in which people enact uh, different communal rituals is, uh, takes place in the plaza. Now, over time, nobles were increasingly co-opting these spaces and also the animate practices that involved the transfer of these this vitality through objects to associated deities. So this, um, this really good 3D model that's, that was put together by uh, the Monte Alban Geophysical uh, Archaeology Project at Oklahoma um, shows that here we have several of these large buildings that flank each of the sides of this kind of central plaza, right? Uh, and these buildings were put in later. So what nobles were essentially doing is, you know, taking over these these animating practices and kind of taking them on for themselves. So the, uh, these, a lot of these are residences, big palaces, but also you find you know, large scale tombs uh, in this area as well, uh, mostly dedicated to, to upper elites and perhaps leaders. Okay, so uh, we've got those two ideas now. We've got the idea of objects being animate, being able to speak and do things. And then we've also got the idea of built landscapes having a role in cosmology, but also a role in the way in which politics is negotiated or are negotiated. 
So we're going to use both of those ideas to look at some of the research that I've done in uh, coastal Oaxaca. Uh, so my perspective uh, in this research explores the, the dynamic ways in which people of varying levels of status negotiate the terms of political authority. And so this pays attention to a lot of things. What this does is it pays attention to the agency of commoners and rural populations, but also the other than human things that make up these assemblages. Um, and in particular, the animate beings that occupy communities, not just people. Um, so it also looks at the social and material relations that define groups of people and whether or not things like religion could enable or constrain things like political integration. So this takes place, or this period of time is the formative period. And this is a really good time for uh, researching some of the earliest signs of political authority, uh, because it's when a lot of the earliest complex polities emerge across Mesoamerica. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the Rio Viejo polity, and this is the seat of political power in the region. Um, it's occupied well before 100 CE, but it becomes uh, a much larger and more, um, I wouldn't say powerful, but uh, a, a much more populous entity at the beginning of the terminal formative period, uh, the late terminal formative period. And so uh, the Mound One Acropolis, which is what you see here, and I should show you where Rio Viejo is first. Uh, Rio Viejo is here. The site that we're gonna be talking about um, in the next few slides and toward the end or for the rest of the uh, lecture is Cerro de la Virgen uh, right there. So um, let's look briefly at Rio Viejo. So here we have uh, a good amount of the site as it's been mapped. And the main area that I wanna look at briefly is Mound One here. So obviously different than Mound One at San Jose Magote. And what we have in terms of, uh, there's been a ton of uh, archeological research that's, that's been done at this site. Um, and what's been found is that the archaeological deposits at the site uh, are indicative of uh, communal building projects. So it's fairly clear that elites and leaders at Rio Viejo were able to bring some people from outside sites into Rio Viejo to construct this large monumental uh, structure. But it also is indicative of the ritual feasts that were going on. Now, as uh, Dr. James mentioned in, my, uh, in her uh, introduction, the polity doesn't last for too long. It collapses relatively quickly, archeologically speaking, a little more than a century later at two, uh, 250 CE. And the region's, uh, the region's settlements kind of disperse into defensible positions in the, uh, in the Piedmont. So my perspective, looks at a couple of different things. And this is what we're gonna kind of end with here. Uh, and this is what I did for my dissertation. So this is the Rio, uh, the Rio Verde hinterland project. And it looks at the types of assemblages that tied people together, right? But not just people, also other than human entities. And that's kind of where we bring in some of that assemblage theory and some of that relational ontology that we were talking about. Uh, so we also wanna ask, you know, were the constituent parts of communities, including both human and other than human entities, were they strongly territorialized and coded across the valley? Meaning that was there political integration? Uh, and so I did this uh, from a lot of different perspectives. What we're going to be looking at uh, for the most part is uh, the ritual resources that constituted social and material relations, um, because that's really where it's uh, mostly uh, best demonstrated. And the focus is going to be on animate public buildings. So we talked about how animacy was infused into Mound One at San Zamagote and then infused again into the uh, main plaza at Monte Alban. And we see the same kinds of things happen in much smaller buildings uh, at the site of Cerro de la Virgen. So here we have the, the region uh, as it's looked at from a uh, satellite. And uh, here we're kind of zooming in on uh, Cerro de la Virgen. It's a small hill located in the foothills of the Piedmont. All right, covers about 72 hectares during the terminal formative period. So, so it's a relatively large site for the region. Uh, and the main area that we're kind of focusing on here is this, this area on the Southern part of this kind of dual hill, uh, larger hill. Um, it's kind of a flatter area that's, that we're looking at here. 
Uh, and the main area that we're going to look at is the civic ceremonial center. So that's what it looks like uh, in a, a, a topographic map. Uh, and so this includes, you know, public architecture, uh, a large residence toward the top of the hill, but also a ball court and a plaza. Um, and so the main areas that I want to focus on is a small uh, restricted temple, most likely a religious building on Terrace 10 here, but then also a little more accessible public building on Terrace 11, as well as another one on Terrace 12. So 10, 11, 12 is what we're going to look at. And we're going to start with structure one. Now, the area, as I mentioned, is a restricted space. It's likely only accessible to elite ritual specialists. And as I mentioned, there's a residence associated with that building that's located uh, near the top of that uh, topographic map. Um, and the results of the excavations that we did at, uh, at this particular site that we conducted in 2013, which seems like a long time ago now, uh, emphasize the animacy of public buildings. And in particular, uh, that they were considered animate members of the community. They were ritually ensouled and nourished and terminated eventually, which emphasizes that they went through a life cycle. And so what we're gonna look at is the idea that, and this is a, this is a idealized, um, an idealized uh, schematic or, or a, 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 a plan, excuse me, a profile of the entire Paris. And the first one I think I want to look at is uh, offering DF24, because it was one of the first things that was deposited in this area. But I also want to emphasize that with each consecutive iteration of this building, there is a dedication offering and then a termination deposit. Dedication offering, termination deposit. Dedication offering, and then perhaps termination deposit. Uh, so uh, this is the pattern that we see in this building, and it all begins with this uh, offering at the uh, on the at the base of this terrace. Uh, and so this is what it looked like in situ. Uh, it was found on bedrock, and it mostly consists of broken stone objects that were placed in a bundle. And uh, we we did some a, a lot of, uh, of photography of different angles to to be able to securely demonstrate that this was uh, these were a lot of objects that were placed into a bundle. Um, and as you can see, it's located right on bedrock. So this is kind of what the bedrock looks like. It's that, that kind of crumbly uh, stuff that you find uh, in the Piedmont. And so uh, when we put all those things together, this is what we found. Uh, so there are a total of five different objects that we're looking at, um, well, that were included in the cache. We're only looking at four here, uh, but the first one is a uh, the mask of a rain deity. So this, this particular piece exhibits a lot of iconographic markers from uh, the Maya area, from the Olmec area, the uh, Highland Oaxaca, uh, and it's it's fairly consistent with those uh, conventions of being a rain god. Uh, at the top here, what we have is a uh, deceased bundle of a uh, person, and so most likely what this is depicting is a deceased ancestor in what is uh, most likely a maize bundle. Right, so it's kind of exploded out where you can see the interior, but this would have been somebody that would have been kind of closed up. And then on the right here, we have two miniature platform thrones. And the reason these are important is that, as you can see, they're, they're not very big at all. They would have been about this big. But what they're indicative of, what they sort of represent, and that's kind of a, a dirty word when we talk about materiality because we want to look beyond what they represent, but they're uh, referencing elite authority. So what we often find in terms of representing elites and leaders is that they're sitting on four-footed thrones just like this. Um, and so uh, in addition, we also found a broken, a smaller stone mass that might've been broken while it was being made. So that gives us some indication that perhaps there was some local work that was being done. Uh, but in particular, this piece here, the, the rain deity mask was of non-local stone. So some of this stuff, at least some of it was coming from a, a faraway distance, at least in raw form. So when we put all this stuff together, right, what we perhaps have is a petition, right? A petition by an elite ritual specialist. And as I mentioned, this is a restricted space. So this is indicated by thrones here. That's mediated by a revered ancestor, the figurine, to the rain deity that is associated with the building. And this would have been perhaps for uh, petitioning for agricultural fertility. Um, because it's also one of the earliest deposits that we find at the site, uh, it might also be foundational 
to the community. You know, one of the earliest kind of foundational offerings that would have constituted the community at large. <clears throat> uh, so one of the things to also note about this deposit is that the objects were intentionally broken. So this essentially uh, can be interpreted as releasing the inherent vitality of these objects uh, and breathing animacy quite literally into the surrounding architecture. So one thing that we know based on a lot of ethnographic, ethno-historic and archeological research is that build uh, uh, objects like this, uh, this rain deity mask were not just representations of the god. They were actually physical incarnations of the god. It was the rain deity. Okay, so that sense in itself of power is infused into the building as it's broken and that power is released. Uh, I just like to throw this slide in uh, really quick because it uh, is, is pretty cool and demonstrates that these things were actually worn. Um, so this is the, uh, the uh, reverse side of the mask. And as you can see, we've got strapping holes here, which would have held it firmly to the face and also a chin rest that would have been made it a little bit more comfortable. So this thing was absolutely worn, at least uh, potentially for um, you know, these potent rituals that would have been done uh, by, by a small group of people. Uh, and then I also like to show this part because it's just super cool. What we have here are you know, anthropomorphic indications of elite status as well, and in particular um, forms of dental modification. Now we, we didn't find any indications of like actual precious stones that would have been emplaced in them. But at the very least, this is a, uh, an allusion to, you know, kind of this elite status idea. And so, um, you know, when we kind of zoom out a little bit, we can see that all of these offerings are kind of stacked on top of each other in terms of dedication, termination, dedication, termination. And so this kind of shows several of those phases with the earliest version of that offering at the very bottom. And then you can see a later termination ritual that would have been associated with um, stone slabs, granite stone slabs, and ceramic vessels. So a little bit different than what we see here. Most likely this was a uh, really important sacred bundle that would have uh, been kind of the foundational offering for the community. Now let's go to uh, a different complex, and this is the complex just below Terrace 10, uh, and that's Terrace 11. Uh, so this is Complex A. This complex consists of a north uh, of a patio, as well as a small uh, modular building. It was a little bit more accessible. Um, and what it included, and again, this is kind of an idealized version, just kind of a diagram or representation. What it included was a large offering of 260 ceramic vessels placed in association with thin vertical stone slabs that were mined from local granite outcrops. So this is what they look like in situ. And uh, in the top left here, in some cases, not, not even close to all, but in some cases, these granite slabs were uh, in, essentially forming a compartment with the vessel inside of it. Uh, in other cases, they were stacked, uh, you know, basically like loaves of bread kind of in, uh, in association with many of these other vessels. Uh, so I'll show you a, a, a complete plan view of what this all looked like after we drew it all. But one thing to also note is that this thing would have been placed over an extended period of time, uh, likely as a ritual to feed the building over time. Remember, we're thinking of buildings as animate, uh, animate beings. And so this is indicated by the idea that we have this earlier short neck jar here that's overlaid by a uh, later cylindrical vessel. <clears throat> uh, so this is what the area occupied by the cache would have looked like. It's about 62 square meters in terms of its total area. And what we have is a series where we have vessels and slabs that were interspersed with things like hearts, which might indicate that there was feasting that was also happening in association with these caching practices. Um, Another kind of more speculative thing that, that I'm kind of throwing out there that, uh, that, I'm, I'm, that uh, uh, my advisor, Art Joyce, has been uh, clamoring for me to, to accept for years now is the idea that we might be seeing an unfolding of time as an aspect of this assemblage. So the fact that there were 200, exactly 260 vessels may be a reference to the 260-day ritual calendar. Uh, and this was the, the cyclical calendar that 
would have been cut, going you know, over and over and over again among uh, different uh, ethno-linguistic groups in Mesoamerica. Um, and now, while this also, this probably took more than 260 days to emplace, so it's not, we're not, I'm not in, uh, suggesting that each vessel was placed in consecutive days, the span of 52 years, which is the time it takes for one full revolution of the calendar round, which associates the ritual calendar and the solar calendar, may not be out of the question. So it might be representative of one of those cycles of time. Now, properties of stone like color and texture and, and place of origin had the potential to really make visceral the cosmovision that was perceived and enacted in ceremonial landscapes. And so the hilly terrain of the local Verde Piedmont is really dotted with these uh, grano, uh, grano diorite outcrops. So that's what we're looking at here. Uh, and these things naturally exfoliate in sheets. And so this process would have facilitated the manufacture of those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of slabs that we saw not only in complex A, which I just showed you, but in other complexes around the site. <clears throat> And so it's kind of speculative as well. Um, it's possible that the residents of Cerro de Guadalajara identified the animate properties that were inherent to this mountain of creation on which they live um, in this natural geological process. And in the placement of those slabs as offerings, which you see on the right side here, um, occasionally you would have offerings of slabs that had no ceramic vessels anywhere near them. This might indicate that um, you know, the slabs themselves had their own animate properties. Uh, so considered in the context of animate buildings, uh, what we might have here is a transference of power, kind of like what we saw at San Jose Magote and Monte Alban, to, from the natural hill to this morally charged receptacle, um, the monumental space of this ceremonial center. Um, what, another thing that I've proposed is that, and I, I should show you that this is a, more of a close up here. So. This is uh, out on the, the modern day landscape. And uh, you can see that some of it had, had actually been uh, mined out in antiquity. Um, it's possible that in addition to this transference of vitality, some of these thin stone slabs might have been placed as markers uh, that indexed different subsets of, of uh, ceramic vessels, maybe perhaps marking a particular family's vessels as opposed to another one. Uh, but these two hypotheses don't really necessarily need to be Exclu mutually exclusive. Now, the last thing I want to look at is kind of how politics comes into play. And this will kind of end uh, the talk here. Now, uh, what we have are uh, comparisons between the assemblage of offering vessels at Cerro de la Virgen and other places around the valley. So on the left here, we have the really nicely made uh, cylindrical vessels from, uh, from Cerro de la Virgen as well as the very nicely made uh, globular jars from the site. And in comparison to uh, this stuff here, which is from the smaller side of Yigüe. And so these are kind of crudely made. Uh, they don't include the, uh, the appearance of, of um, globular jars. They're, they're lower fired, uh, fired at lower temperatures. And so they just look very, very different in terms of how they're made. So there's certainly not a central kind of recipe for making these things, nor is there a central recipe for the kinds of objects that are included in these animating practices. So these are drawings from the site of San Francisco de Arriba, and it includes, uh, the, the offerings that are at that site include uh, uh, cylindrical vessels, but they don't include these kinds of uh, globular jars. So that's one very distinct regional idiosyncrasy that we're seeing here. And we also see quite a bit of variation in the exotic objects that were placed as offerings. So this is the, the uh, Yugwe fruit. This was found with a, um, a, a religious specialist, a, a young adult that was most likely uh, some form of like shaman. And uh, what we have here is essentially a, a religious object that could be played as a musical instrument. And the iconography of this piece indicates that it is referencing a deceased ancestor that's essentially flying on the, uh, this, this deer femur um, as it's really finely carved. And so the hybrid, the assemblage with the ritual specialist and this musical instrument would have 
altogether been a completely different entity. Um, so in addition to that, we also have other offerings of exotic objects around the, uh, the valley that really don't look anything like what we just saw here or at Cerro de la Virgen. So there's a lot of regional variability. Um, one of the things that still remains to be seen is whether there's variability in burial practices. Now at the bottom here, you have uh, burial contexts from the side of Igwe. Uh, and they are typically exhibited in a uh, form of communal cemeteries. And at the top here, we have the um, only the, the small burial context of, uh, of remains found at uh, Cerro de la Virgen, which typically are, are discrete and, and not in the form of large scale uh, cemeteries. So the assemblages of the dead and the associated objects really might not have been highly coded in terms of their, uh, the, the types of things that needed to be bundled together. Okay, and then finally, uh, what we have in terms of practices that involve kind of more utilitarian things was the idea that we have large scale feasting, not just at Mound, the Mound One Acropolis at Rio Viejo, but also out in the hinterland. So this is an example of, a, of an earth oven that's found out in the hinterland that would have most likely drawn people in for a large scale religious um, a ritual feasts. And it's, it's not nearly as big as the one that was found at um, Rio Viejo, but it would have been similar in terms of its function. So how can we bring this all together? Right, so uh, using kind of the, the ideas of uh, assemblage theory, um, what I kind of propose is that, and this is just for the lower Verde here, is that uh, there was territorialization and coding in the general types of materials and ideas that could invoke the sacred covenant, and also the things that could constitute communities. And this was a complete focus on public buildings. So that was something that was shared throughout the uh, valley in a general sense. However, the kinds of things that could be, uh, could infuse buildings with vitality was decoded and, and highly deterritorialized. And what this does is it leads to a, a situation where we have stratification on the local level, where the assemblages of buildings and objects and people and ancestors and all those things that occupied these roles as animate members could vary from site to site. So in general, this kind of get, brings us to a, a, a case where we have you know, strong local affiliations that likely conflicted with these regional affiliations that would have been centered at Rio Viejo. So uh, that is uh, my talk. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all the people that I worked with in, uh, in the field, especially the people of, uh, of um, San Jose uh, del Progreso, San Felipe, uh, also you know, all my funding uh, sponsors and um, thank you guys for coming. If you want more uh, info on a lot of these uh, ideas, and uh, these, these excavations that are still ongoing, um, you can visit this site, uh, www.colorado.edu backslash or forward slash Rio Verde Archaeology. And with that, I guess I will open it up to uh, questions. Great. Um, thank you so much for that fascinating talk, Jeff. That was really interesting and such a complex idea delivered so clearly. I really, um, I really appreciate okay, that, was, that. That was the that was the attempt. <laughs> <laughs> well, you succeeded. Okay. Um, before we go to the Q and A, did you have one last slide that you wanted I to did. show? Yeah, us? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No worries. Yeah. So uh, uh, the next talk that is coming uh, to the Museum of Natural History is going to be Dr. Sam, uh, Sam Flad's talk on Accumulating identities and trash, examining dispositional patterns with uh, within ancestral pueblo villages. That's going to be Wednesday, May fifth, at seven p.m. Just like what we're doing right now. Thank you for that. So that was really interesting. Um, I wanted to start off. I will selfishly ask questions first because um, I sure. find this really interesting. And um, I've actually worked with a lot of foundation deposits in Greece, so it was. It was interesting to see the kinds of material that you have, and yet at the same time, these deposits are forming within architecture for the same reason, right? Foundation deposits, remodeling deposits, and then kind of abandonment deposits too. Right. 
really fascinating. Um, we don't have the same kind of nuance though, um, or at least we can't talk about these objects in the same way that you can. But I was wondering, I looked, I noticed when you were talking about um, structure one on Terrace 10, that there was a deposit that was a mixture of ceramics and stone. Yeah. It was the second one. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about how pottery and stone were used differently in these kinds of caches. Yeah. So if we go back to this one, is this one you're talking about there? Yeah, that was kind of okay. caught my okay. eye. Uh, so between the different structures at the site, we have some very, like, very slight variability in how these stone slabs were used. Um, but in general, the, the types of uh, objects that were placed in termination deposits were typically um, shallow bowls. And they also often included the burned remains of the structure itself, right? So essentially you have like this offering placed down and then the building is burned on top of it. Um, so in that sense, it's not just the vessels, not just the, the slabs, but it's also the the kind of ritual killing of the building, um, the, the uh, perishable building on top of it. Um, there, uh, if I go back to, let's see. Let's see, so uh, there's, you know, quite a few other contexts where we have the appearance of uh, either vessels, slabs, or one or the other. And one really interesting co uh, context in which we find just slabs but no vessels is in the plaza. And essentially, and I just kind of ran out of the ability to include all of this stuff, uh, but they were kind of stacked on top of each other over the course of almost like half a meter. Uh, and the interpretation that I kind of went back and forth with was whether this was a storage area for these things or if it was actually an independent kind of discrete offering itself. And you know, I, I kind of think it's the latter because of you know this idea of the vitality of the surrounding uh, landscape being infused into that built landscape kind of makes a little bit more sense in terms of all the other things that we also see in context. Does that does that kind of answer or address what you're uh, what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, I noticed that the ceramic vessels aren't broken the same way that. The stone ones are. Why do you think that might be? Is it because right. their contents are valued? Yeah, so interestingly, and th this is something that I haven't really uh, wrapped my head around completely yet, and it's also some, uh, there's another context that I didn't include here, uh, which was a, an effigy vessel of a human foot that was also uh, placed as an offering at the base of the plaza, and that was the only other thing that was ritually broken. So what we might have is that uh, things that carry anthropomorphic kind of images might be more powerful in terms of infusing that force into whatever the surrounding architecture is. So yeah, the only two things that we found that were ritually purposefully broken had human elements to it. So it just kind of you know, under, underscores the emphasis on this human thing you know, uh, hybrid or, or assemblage that we can kind of look at that. Ah, interesting. And um, we actually have a follow-up question on that. How do you know they were intentionally broken as opposed to accidentally broken? Yeah, so uh, let's see. So one thing that we can look at here is that this piece and this piece uh, are refits, right? So um, I actually did some experiments with this in terms of other types of, uh, of similar types of, of rock and breaking them, putting them into a bundle and then letting them drop and putting sediment over them. And they fell in a lot of similar ways. Uh, so uh, the other idea that they, uh, there are refits on opposite sides of this, of this deposit. So this is one side of one of those, um, those platform or the miniature, miniature platform, uh, uh, table plat miniature platform, excuse me, platform thrones. And the other piece is right over here. So that's pretty indicative of being smashed first and then deposited in essentially a bag. And that's, you can imagine that, you know, if you have a bag of rocks, they're kind of gonna fall like that as you're placing them on a flat surface. 
Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And in some of my deposits, they're also burned. So you'll find some pieces are burnt and other pieces aren't burnt and they're in different parts. So um, that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. Um, okay. So I have a couple questions. Um, kind of more um, theoretical ones. Well, maybe not theoreticals, but um, someone was asking um, if they wanted to understand more about materiality, what books or articles would you recommend that they look at? Sure. Uh, so the, um, the book that, uh, for assemblage theory, the book that I've kind of relied on the most would have been uh, Ben Jervis's book. And I think it's, it was published in uh, 2019. And I believe that's from Rutledge. Um, so that would be something that I would look at. And it's, it's, a, be it's a much better uh, version of what I just did and a lot more detailed in terms of trying to break down these concepts in a way that uh, makes sense. Because, uh, you know, even for people that are super interested in this stuff and that are really, um, you know, focused on trying to understand it, the verbiage and the, the concepts are really complicated. So to find a, uh, a text to really to get at some of this stuff is, is really um, important. Um, some, there are some Mayanists that have been working a lot on uh, some of these topics as well. So I have mentioned Matthew Leeper, um, but also Eleanor um, uh, Harrison Buck is another, is another uh, Mayan, Mayanist that has done a lot of work. Our, uh, Art Joyce has done a ton of work in terms of thinking about this stuff uh, from the Valley of Oaxaca. And I'm sure he's coming out with a lot of stuff from uh, the Lower Rio Verde as well. Um, so there, there is a, a good edited volume. And I have that in one of the slides. Um, so I can, I can kind of go back here real quick. So, so this book that I, that I reference here is another good one. And it's, it's, it takes an assemblage theory perspective on specifically urbanism. So there are a lot of different perspectives um, from around the world that are that are part of that edited volume. So I would recommend that. Um, and then in terms of, of relational ontology, uh, Craig Sippel has done a lot of work. Um, Oliver Harris has done a lot of work on this stuff. Uh, and I pull from them pretty significantly in terms of uh, their descriptions and their, their uh, ways of kind of breaking this stuff down. Wonderful, wonderful. Maybe um, if you would be willing to um, like share with me a short list, I can, sure, I can send yeah. that to anyone who's interested. For Thank sure. you for that question. Um, on a kind of similar vein, um, Patricia Carell is asking, um, do you include ethnographies or oral histories in formulating your interpretation? Uh, yeah, so I mentioned a couple of those in uh, kind of looking at the ways in which the Maya um, think about the vitality and the ontology of other than human things. So a lot of that is based on ethnography, especially from Highland Maya sites. Um, and then uh, we can look at ethno-historic stuff as well. So looking at um, the, the Mishtek codices and seeing how the concept of the object is, is used in different, in different ways um, is, is also you know, outside of the archeological theorizing. Um, I, so she said, uh, ethnography and oral histories, oral histories, um, I haven't gotten into as much, you know, I, I'm actually on the precipice of, of this, of this, you know, body of theory as well. So, uh, I appreciate you guys kind of listening to my talk because this is one way in which I was able to wrap my head around some of this stuff and try to distill it down. So I am certainly not a, uh, an expert in it, uh, yet, hopefully, but, um, I have not looked at any oral histories in terms of this particular idea, other than the sense of um, the life force of buildings being something that is, is really important in terms of placing certain objects in certain parts of the house in order to feed the structure, in order to uh, in, you know, uh, dedicate it and, and terminate it and things like that. A lot of that is from uh, oral histories as well. Interesting. It's it's exciting that you're kind of on the precipice of all of these, including yeah, all these yeah. new ideas in your work. That's that's great. Um, we have a question from Lynn Keller, who's asking, in the Sarah de la Vergen pick of the fine cylindrical vessels and globular vessels, did you choose to select and arrange the top 13 vessels over the nine vessels? 
<laughs> no, I didn't. That's that's crazy. I, I never would have picked that up. That's a that's an amazing you know observation there. No, I did not intentionally um, orient those. Let me, let me go back to this. Sorry, it's like all the way at the other end of the, the lecture. Um, but the question was, did I orient them in terms of thirteen and nine, which are indicative of um, you know thirteen sky steps, nine um, underworld steps? No, I did not. I just basically put the nicest ones and of different variability of sizes and shapes, just to give you a sense of, of kind of the breadth of different vessel forms and, and what they were you know, um, buried with. Um, and I, I should note that um, one question I'm typically asked about that, so no, there was no connotation to the cosmos in that regard, but that's a really good question. Um, in terms of what was found inside of these things, we excavated uh, you know, several dozen of them to look for uh, macro botanical remains, you know, charred seeds, things like that. Um, just regular, you know, objects that would have been indicative of, you know, uh, a smaller part of the offering. And we didn't really find much in terms of that. Um, then we did, uh, you know, there was a, a student of, um, <clears throat> of Shanti Moral Hearts, uh, Elwa Berebe, who did micro botanical extractions of uh, some of the residues of these of these pots, and we also didn't really find much. So interestingly, there doesn't appear to be a whole lot left inside of these really nicely preserved uh, vessels. So you know, there's there's a couple different interpretations of that. Uh, one would be that they were just empty, right? They might have had spiritual contents. Um, another example or another possibility is they might have had liquids that we just can't. Um, look, we can't detect by the various means that we've already gone through. So macro botanical and micro botanical. So we might have to go to, um, to chemical analyses to try to suss some of that out. Uh, but it's still a really open-ended question and I, I really wanna know. I was convinced for a while before uh, Elwa did the micro botanical extractions that it was, um, it was fermented maize beer, but it did not, it did not fulfill my my uh, fantasy of that um, because that would have been really cool to to, to demonstrate, but uh, unfortunately, it didn't. definitely, um, yeah. I, I kind of wondered I, the same question, especially with these cylindrical ones, because um, you know holding them in place might suggest that they would be continually refilled with something that. Right. It's 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 still a mystery to me. Um, what you would fill with this thing here, um, this guy. I'm not sure, because that would be essentially a pony keg <laughs> um, in terms of its, of its size. I mean, it would be that, uh, that big. Um, and there are other eccentric sizes of, of vessels that uh, there was one that we found on structure one that was almost 70 centimeters tall. In so we nicknamed it, uh, uh, what did we nickname it? The bazooka, because it really looked like something that was that long. And it boggles my mind that a potter was able to do that without destroying it. Because it was, you know, essentially this, this size in terms of its, of its diameter, but it was two and three times longer. So I'm not sure what you would be putting in there um, other than just demonstrating that you could do it, I guess. I'm not, I'm not uh, clear on that one either. There are still a lot of open-ended questions to some of this stuff. Yeah, so uh, you've kind of answered this already, but our, our final question um, I'd like to pose to you comes from Stacy, who asks, you know, what, are you going to continue this work and sort of any directions that you haven't mentioned that you're thinking about taking it? Yeah, uh, hopefully in the future, I want to uh, investigate a couple of other smaller scale sites around the region to kind of compare the context of, you know, what it means to be a hinterland community. So looking at, um, you know, a bigger site than Cerro de la Virgen, but also a smaller site than Cerro de la Virgen and comparing it to the rest of the assemblage of stuff that we already know about the region. That's one way in which I would, uh, I would definitely be interested in. And another one is to really figure out what the heck is going on with these vessels. So that's another avenue that, um, that can be explored perhaps in a little bit more of a, of a tight project than, you know, a full on excavation project is, uh, as we were talking about before we came on, who knows when we're actually going to be able to do that again. Um, 
Uh, so uh, hopefully it'll happen soon. Wonderful. Well, I, I hope that does all happen. And I want to thank you again so much for this really fascinating talk. Um, thanks to everyone who attended. I'm sure if you have additional questions, um, you can email um, Dr. Brzezinski about them. And um, I hope that you will all join us for our next presentation on May 5th. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for attending.